Hey everyone, this is Shidoshi, and welcome to the audio recording for Replay, Transgender Industry Professionals, New Lives, Old Careers. This panel was at PAX Prime 2012 on Friday, August 31st, and featured panelists Charles Battersby, Rebecca Heineman, Janelle Jaquez, Caitlin Cusinelli, Kelly Worrell, and Maddie Bryce. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out to the best panel at the Best Video Game Expo that's happening this weekend. Yeah! So this is Replay, Transgender Industry Professionals, New Lives, Old Careers. And the people that are up here on the stage today, uh, we are all um, in various stages of uh, uh, transgender, which we're using as kind of a catch-all term today for cross-dressers, for pre-op and post-op transsexuals. So we may not be using it in the most clinical sense, we're just using it as a umbrella term. Uh, now, we work in various media, some of us are in video games, some are in television, some are in theater, um, but the one thing that we all have in common is that at some point during our career, we've had a moment where we've had to reveal that we're a transgendered person. So we're going to discuss what that's like, how it affects our careers, uh, what points we were in our career when we made that decision. Um, I am Charles Battersby, I'm a writer for uh, several websites, including a terribly clever one called the United States Department of Electronic Entertainment, which is a satire site. Uh, I also write for Explosion.com and previously wrote for Player Affinity and a few other websites. And before I worked in video games, I was a playwright as well. Uh, I did uh, a couple of plays with transgender themes like Stopless Go-Go Girls at the Troll Hole. <laughs> <laughs> And the actual show is even funnier than the title. <laughs> and I did uh, a show uh, called Kryptonite Hearts, which featured a uh, cross-dressing vigilante dominatrix. Uh, and just recently, I did a play that's inspired by the video game Fallout called That Cute Radioactive Couple. <laughs> <laughs> and now let's introduce the rest of the panelists. Hi, I'm Kelly Worrell. I'm a producer with Electronic Arts. I'm up in Burnaby, BC, Canada. Uh, yeah. <laughs> go, Canada, go. Um, I, but I'm not Canadian. <laughs> uh, sorry to disappoint everybody. I'm a fan of, yeah, surprises. Uh, I, I come from Virginia. Uh, I started out in the game industry in, in the mid-90s with America Online, and uh, <laughs> but then I got into like real gaming with Kesmai, which was eventually bought out by Electronic Arts, and I moved over to the Origin team uh, in Austin, Texas, uh, and eventually out to California, and then I bounced over to Massachusetts and worked on Lord of the Rings Online, Dungeons and Dragons Online. Um, yeah, I, it's been a hell of a career. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then, yeah, and then I, I bounced around some more. And then uh, EA somehow wanted me back uh, and brought me back to Canada, where I, I now work on sports titles. Uh, so if anybody knows Madden or FIFA or NHL, um, if you don't, then our marketing department has failed miserably. <laughs> uh, they tend to be very good at that. So uh, <laughs> yeah, buy our products. <laughs> awesome. Um, hi, I'm Caitlin Cusinelli. Um, I am the first openly transgender person on MTV's Real World. Uh, uh, uh. Um, yeah, I know. My, um, I, I work in entertainment, um, but my start is really, my background is mainly in IT, because I'm a server jockey. I'm a Unix systems administrator and network engineer by trade. <laughs> Woo! All three people who know what that means. Um, so yeah, but I, I got my start relatively early um, for a huge web hosting company that completely and totally sucks because they're not that huge anymore. Um, called Vario, I don't think anyone. No, crickets? Good. Um, <laughs> excellent. Uh, yeah, and then from there I was kind of working when MTV recruited me. And by recruited me, I mean I was dragged to a casting call kicking and screaming by my best friend. Um, and I got launched into an entertainment career. And I spend my, um, my entertainment side of it really doing college lectures for advocacy and, uh, and as well as doing local community building and organizing and advocacy and charity work within there. So that's really what my career is today, so. Hi, I'm Maddie. Woo, uh, Woo awesome. <laughs> People know who I am. <laughs> I, uh, 
Um, I do uh, game criticism and social justice activism in video games. So I've written places at like Border House, at, yeah. <laughs> um, at, uh, I've been at Kotaku, Gama Sutra, and Paste. So I do a lot of journalism, well, I don't do journalism, but I talk with journalists, and I do other media, yeah, I guess it's journalism. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do a lot of media like. stuff, and um, I'm currently at uh, San Francisco State University with my grad, and I'm gonna be doing work on narrative design and how that can involve things like romance, and especially with queer identities, which is gonna be super fun. Uh, and I think that wraps me up a bit. Hi, I'm Becky. Many people know me as Burger. And um, I got my start in 1980, winning the Atari National Space Invaders Tournament for the Atari 2600. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So after killing aliens for a couple of years, I got uh, working on Atari 2600 cartridges for Avalon Hill, then went and was helping found a company called Interplay. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. <laughs> Um, so I did games like Mind Shadow, Tracer Sanction, uh, Borrowed Time, goes on. But uh, one I'm most known for is Bard's Tale 3, The Thief of Fate. Mm -hmm. And then worked <laughs> on so many titles that are in place, everything I wrote, the Out of This World for the Super Nintendo. I was the one who wrote that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> but, uh, That's awesome. Guy in the back loved it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yay! Because it helps pay my paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> but in 2003, um, I transitioned when I was Electronic Arts. And uh, been since then, been doing so many games, it's not funny. Most recently, I did this little stand on a game called, I don't know if you've heard of it, Borderlands 2? Um, <laughs> maybe. Um, Take it away. Hi, I'm Janelle Jaquez. Um, I started in the role-playing game, traditional, uh, I guess it's called tabletop role-playing game industry um, in 1975. <laughs> and, um, I worked for a little publisher in Illinois called Judges Guild and wrote game adventures for them that are still in print, what are we, 35, 36 years later? Um, but that w I got to be a pioneer in role-playing games and then immediately shifted over to being a pioneer in 8-bit video games. I went to Coleco and was the director, ended up as the director of game design on the ColecoVision and Atom computer titles, everything that Coleco did during the very short life of the console, because <laughs> um, we ended up with the collapse of the video game industry. Uh, freelance for a number of years as an artist and designer. Uh, ended up, finally, as a cover artist for TSR, the people who publish Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, moved on from there to another one of those little companies you may have heard of, id Software. Um, <laughs> I was a level designer on Quake 2, Quake 3, Quake 3 Team Arena. Moved over from there to Interplay. Not, excuse me, Interplay. Actually, Interplay was one of my clients when I was freelance. So um, I did, worked on uh, Lord of the Rings as a content designer. Um, but I, later on, I, I, from TSR, I went to id, id to Ensemble Studios, Microsoft, uh, worked on Age of Empires titles and Halo Wars, and then spent the last three years as the lead level designer at CCP on their Vampire the Masquerade MMO, A World of Darkness. <laughs> right now, I'm located here in Seattle. Um, I'm the uh, Chief Creative Officer of a new startup called Old School Games, or Old School, and uh, relaunching my freelance career with Dragon Girl Studios. Nice. Oh, and I should, probably should finish. I came out within the last year at CCP. Oh, okay. And on the exact opposite end of the spectrum, uh, I came out 20 years ago um, when I was still working in theater. And so I was so open and overt about uh, the fact that I'm a cross-dresser that when I started writing for video games, uh, I never really needed to make any sort of announcement to let my employers or coworkers or readers know. Um, so it's just been a matter of fact for me throughout my career. Um, Kelly, on the other hand, had a very high profile uh, revealing. Can you tell us a little about that? 
Sure. Um, so it wasn't really intended to be high profile. Um, <laughs> wasn't, never are. wasn't the ultimate goal, right? I had dreams of, uh, at one point in the beginning of my transition, I, I had sort of this vision of passing as a woman and nobody will ever know that I was, you know, that I used to be a guy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I, you know, and then, um, Somehow news of my transition splashed over Kotaku, <laughs> and I, I realized that that wasn't ever really going to happen. Um, <laughs> guess what? Guess who's not going stealth? Uh, so, but that was okay. So I also trans like like Janelle. I transitioned um, last year uh, over the over the course of the summer. I guess when you say I transitioned, that's kind of a, a difficult thing to say because I, we're all of us are human beings. We're growing. We're changing. We're developing all the time. Um, so, but I, I began uh, living publicly as Kelly uh, June 24th of last year. And um, the experience has been uh, like surreal. Uh, it, it was, it was, um, it was very frightening for me at first. I have a friend who's here. I don't know if they want to be identified or not. No, yes, yes, <laughs> no, yes. Uh, <laughs> So when I went to my HR coordinator, um, for anybody who's considering, by the way, coming out at work, and I assume there's probably at least one or two who are here who are thinking, you know, I, I don't know why you came to this particular discussion. Um, <laughs> I, who knows? Uh, but for people who do plan to come out in the office, um, it can be a very intimidating um, thing to do. It's frightening. You know, I'm going to what do I do? Do I just you know walk in one day in a skirt and hope for the best? Because uh, that's going to result in chaos and madness. And um, and you're fairly certain that no matter what you do, it's going to result in chaos and madness anyway. Your family's going to hate you. Your coworkers will never accept you. Um, nobody will ever date you again. Uh, that's that's actually a little bit a little bit true. Uh, no, it's not true. It's not true. <laughs> Charles is going to go out with me later. Um, I'm. Maybe I'm teasing. Uh, the, the point is, it's a very, very frightening uh, experience. So I, I was very blessed. Um, I went to my HR coordinator at Electronic Arts first, um, a woman named Ellen Wallace, who, is, uh, who had no idea how to handle a transition uh, in the workplace. But the beauty of it is, that was the first thing she opened up with was, was hey, uh, I have no idea how to do this. So let's, you know, let's work together. Um, they turned to me a lot for guidance on, well, how do we do this? How do we do that? Um, trouble was, I'd never transitioned before either. <laughs> um, so it was, a little, it was a little bit touch and go at times. You know, oh, you should do it this way. You know, well, you're the expert. You're the, I'm not the expert. Uh, fortunately, um, we did have a number of resources around. Kayla Knoonan, um, you want to wave? Yeah, stand up, say hi. Woo! Yeah. Kayla was my um, guiding light and source of inspiration and comfort and reassurance um, throughout this time. Kayla transitioned at Electronic Arts maybe nine years ago, yeah, okay. nine, ten years ago, um, in the QA department. And um, EA, for those of you who've, how many people have ever worked at Electronic Arts in here? We got a few. And All right, four. Not, not bad. <laughs> four. Um, five. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, EA has turnover like crazy and, and are, are, are particularly, um, like most large companies, sometimes information gets lost in the mix. So, um, Yeah, 2004 when I well, did my transition. Yeah, Becky <laughs> transitioned in 2004. I had a policy in place at EA. I'm like, what happened to it? Yeah, <laughs> it vanished. Um, <laughs> it vanished in corporate changes. Kayla's transition, um, probably not as high profile. You were in QA at the time, right? So. Uh, uh, a, a little bit easier to kind of skirt under the under the rug. When you're coming out as a producer, it's a little bit you know it's a little more spotlighty. Um, but uh, but we had to relearn the entire process from scratch. Uh, and I, I guess what I want to say is for people who are considering coming out, um, you do have the right to do it. You have the right to be protected. You have the right not to be harassed um, by people. Your human rights group knows that. Your human relations uh, HR team. Uh, so go to them. Don't be afraid. Uh, if they give you a hard time, there are numerous advocacy groups that are sprouting up that will help you find legal representation if you feel like your your company is not being supportive. Um, so yeah, I just uh, I think that's that's about what I want to say. Don't be afraid to uh, to be yourself. You have the right to do so, uh, and and every company should be behind you. 
uh, during that process. And uh, depending on the state where you live, there may be um, strict laws regarding discrimination in the workplace. Yeah, you're not allowed to in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yay, Canada. Canada's awesome. Uh, anyone else want to share their tale of uh, transitioning? Yeah, um, I had, because I had the exact opposite experience uh, that you had. Um, when I came out, I came out when I was 17. I actually was kicked out of my house when I was 17, so kind of forced to. Well, I was... I'm a geek, okay? So like I, when I decided to transition, I created like this dossier of information online and TS Roadmaps and other transsexual resources weren't available back then. So I had to like go to like libraries and I think like a microfiche was involved. I think like an 80s montage of me just like going through research, you know, I have the tiger playing in the background. Um, you know, and so I, I, I had this portfolio that I handed my mom and she looked at it and she looked at me and she's like, can't you just smoke weed like other kids? Like, really? Like, this is going to be a thing? Um, so, but no, it, it all, it all came, kind of like came to blows. And so I lived like my life super androgynous when I was 17, 18, but I started working in IT really early. That was my career path. It's something I've always been really good and good with and passionate about. So when I came out, I was super androgynous and when I was in boy mode or whatever, um, I don't ever consider myself in boy mode. Like I'm, I'm too fabulous to have ever existed in the masculine <laughs> spectrum. Um, like, you know, my mom tried to put me into all these sports and things like that. And to this day, the only thing I can throw is really great brunch. I'm like, mom, what the fuck were you thinking? <laughs> um, really? Um, so uh, when, when, I was, uh, <laughs> when, uh, when I was in IT and I approached my, my HR director, and now I'm from South Florida. I'm from Miami. Yes. Uh, well, Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Um, the one other Floridian. Yay! Um, <laughs> So I, when I came out to, to my HR director, uh, when I got hired on, I'm like, look, this is the situation with me. And she looked at me and she's like, um, no, we're not okay with that. I'm like, well, one, who's we? And because uh, we need to have a little talk. I'm Sicilian too. We aggressively negotiate. Um, so, so I'm like, like who all is we? Um, and she's, she's like, well, no, we, you know, there are. I had no protections. In Florida at the time, I had zero end up pr um, protections. And Florida is a right to work state, which means that they can fire you for any reason or no reason at all. Um, they don't need a reason to, to chicane you, um, which eventually happened to me a few years later. So this HR director was uh, a, a succubus. There's really no, um, <laughs> like, I, I wish I could kill her over and over again to get experience to level up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just. <laughs> They respawn quickly, the HR people. Yeah, they do. <laughs> really, really low respawn timer on these guys. But like, I, I, I face a lot of workplace discrimination. And, and now I'm a server jockey. Customers don't see me. There's zero customer impact. The only time that, I, that there's customer impact is that if I do an RM-RF on route, you know, like, then there's customer impact. If I, if, if I accidentally drop a SQL database, then there's customer impact. But whether I want to wear shorts or a skirt or whatever to work, no impact on the customer. So she started off by denying me access to the bathrooms, which was fun because I worked overnight. We were a skeleton crew. There were a total of 10 of us. And she's like, well, you know, we've been getting uh, um, complaints from your coworkers. I'm like, first off, I'm not a day walker. So what coworkers? Number one. Um, number two, I work with a bunch of guys. Fuck off. I mean, like if they're in the women's restroom and, and they're complaining, then you've got other problems right. <laughs> going on here. You know, quagmires attached to the roof, like giggity, you know, just like, <laughs> fuck out. Um, <laughs> So I, I left, uh, I left Vario on really, really bad terms. And it was around the time that MTV picked me up and I was, and they focused, if not kind of exploited in a very he heavy handed way. of like, we've got a tranny, you know, it's like real world relevant again, you know, like, please watch us, please, dear God. Um, but they didn't focus on any of, of my geek stuff. It was sort of like, I felt like, like there were two identities that I was then living in. I had to deal with my trans identity or I had to deal with my geek identity. And they're not mutually exclusive mm -mm. at all. And the more that I worked within advocacy, the more I found that there's, there seems to be a disproportionate number of trans women specifically within the tech and, and media and industry fields. Yes. And I don't know what it is. I like to think that we're like Blade, like we're the best of both worlds, okay? <laughs> like, so I've got like the logical reasoning down, right? And I know that there are more than four colors in the spectrum. So I feel like, you know, man, sex drive, I don't have Shark Week once a month. Like it's just, um, yeah, I, Shark Week, CSI Week, Murder Scene, any way you look Just at it. Shark week. Um, uh, so, at the panel that we did uh, at PAX East, Janelle mentioned that sometimes uh, 
uh, men will overcompensate with the nerd path rather than the jock path. Yeah. And that's one reason why there is a disproportionate number. I can see that, right? Mm -hmm. Because like, like the, the idea that a lot of trans women have is that like, well, I can't... Sorry. No, it's rude. <laughs> <laughs> Security. Security. Hold on a second. Um, I will creek, creek. cut Whew. you. My 305 came out. Um, Oh, yeah, no, it, and, and, right, and that happens a lot with, with, with trans women. When, when we are forced to suppress our identity, we like, okay, well, maybe if I could over-masculinize, um, then, then I can repress this, this sort of side of me. And that's why you see a lot of people who were like ex-Navy SEALs, like these ex-military people, <laughs> and when they come out and they're like, like, how could you be trans? Well, you don't realize that they, they were doing these things to kind of prove to themselves, you know, that, that, okay, well, maybe if I can boy up, I can get rid of the side of me. And it comes from this great incongruity with, you know, with your and what society deems you should be. Um, and it's weird because like IT is a very male dominated industry. So before when I was in boy mode, I had lots of privileges that no longer are extended to me now that I'm a woman in IT. I'm like, this is some bullshit. Like not, not a few years ago, I was a card carrying member of your association. And now, <laughs> now because I wear a skirt to work or a dress or you know, whatever. You forgot to renew. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was dropped, um, you know? Perhaps so I, you I, think, I think it's funny to experience sexism for the first time on the opposite end. I'm like, wow, that's, that's some bullshit. I'm like, I, now I see why people are offended about that because I'm ready to cut people over this shit. Because um, 305, that's how we roll, we cut people. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, that's kind of, that's my coming out experience. And in, in the media, it's fine, right? It's like, oh, you're one of those queerosexuals, we'll throw you on TV. Queerosexual. <laughs> you know, it's like, you're fine, you're great for ratings. I go on TV, Twitter feed blows up, my self-esteem goes down, and everyone makes money. Uh, I don't know how that works. Um, Sweet. But, uh, but yeah, that was my experience. Uh, anyone else want to share their uh, harrowing tale? <laughs> well, my harrowing tale was the fact that since I transitioned in a high-profile position in 2003, mine was more of terror. Because at the time, um, well, the only people that I knew of that had transitioned before had all been ostracized. They, uh, a friend of mine, Danny Bunton, was rejected totally by her family. Uh, another woman who transitioned at Interplay um, was totally was, was forced out of the company. Um, so with the success stories, as you would so not want to say about, um, I was looking at myself going like, you know what, I'm going to be flipping burgers. So I'm really going to be using a nickname burger for a while. So um, after gritting my teeth, um, I went ahead and decided that this is it. I got a transition. I, and I was completely prepared to be flipping burgers or changing my career because despite the fact that I, had, at the time, had already been working in the game industry for almost 20 years, have hundreds of games to my credit, I, that would mean nothing, absolutely nothing. Because, you know, when the creator of Mule gets thrown out, um, what does the creator of Bard's Tale 3 have a chance? When I went to the Electronic Arts uh, HR department, I found that they actually had a draft of a transition document. And with that, I spoke to them saying, what's this document? And they're like, that's yeah, just something laying around. Says, well, <coughs> let's work on this. <laughs> and they go like, why? I'll tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> this is why. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so um, in the next couple of months, work with HR, uh, kept it a little secret. Of course, at this time, I was doing my hormones, electrolysis, and so forth. And I was coming to work sometimes with a hat. And I even had to wear chest binders because I was presenting in boy mode and no one knew except my manager who was like snickering every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> and it came to a head when finally the game I was working on, Medal of Honor uh, European Assault, we had to distribute uh, the credits list. So they had, you know, you know Burger Bill Heineman, and then I said, oh, Burger Becky Heineman. And it gets changed back. Like, Wait a minute. Burger <laughs> Becky Heineman. Like he's changing back. And then I get this email from uh, the guy who's in charge of the credits, and he goes, like, I just checked the uh, server logs. You're changing the name. Why are you doing this? So I then, of course, uh, said, Can I have a few minutes of your time? <laughs> Went over to his office. He's like, OK, Burger, what's up? But show you. So I was in a high back chair. Give me a minute. Spun around. Hair went down. 
pulled the binders down, spun back up. <laughs> <laughs> That is a MasterCard moment. <laughs> Priceless. <laughs> very. And uh, it wasn't very much longer when I then announced, and I was saying, okay, I am so fired. I am so fired. And it was the opposite. I had pretty much every single VP, the president, et cetera, of Electronic Arts, each one by one take me out to dinner, saying how brave I was and I had to repeat that damn burger story again. <laughs> um, but after that, I was like, uh, you know, my manager, you know, when I did first come out to him, his thing's like, okay, you're a chick. Get back to work. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that hey, is awesome. Hey, props to you for coming out on the credits. That's like... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, that's yeah, the that's way to like, go. If anybody like, else can do that, that's, yeah, way to go. <laughs> hey, I wasn't going to spend nine months writing the engine on that damn game and not get my <laughs> name on it. <laughs> damn straight. Well, mine was actually one of the, um, I'll call it one of the easier transitions. When I finally came to understand and self-accept about just a little about a year and a half ago, um, I knew I had to do this by the book. And I started out... Um, going through all the processes I needed to do. And during one of those processes, the woman who did my hair removal revealed to me, oh, there's another woman, there's another trans woman working in the game industry here in Atlanta. And she got permission to put us in contact, and it turned out she worked for the same company I did. <laughs> um, but she was fully out and stealth, just, when I say she was stealth, no one knew. So we made acquaintances, and then over the course of the summer, um, we outed ourselves to HR because we wanted to try and convince the company to change the health care to give trans people benefits. They at least looked. Um, so over the course of the next several months, I went reverse up the food chain. Um, first my manager, then my producer, and then finally, just before it became time to come out, um, I, I went and presented, or at least talked, I wasn't presenting yet, I talked with um, both the CEO and the uh, corporate attorney. I uh, shared my coming out letter with them. They made a few changes, a few wording changes that they felt more comfortable with as my employer. And just before the Christmas break, I um, basically threw the switch and left the company in 2011 as uh, my former name and came back in 2012 as Janelle. And during the process of things um, that Christmas, um, I already knew there was one other trans woman working in Iceland for the company. Um, but afterwards, I discovered there was at least one other one who just wasn't willing to come out yet. So that was one of the processes. As I came out, other people came out to me privately. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm there to do for them now, if they ask, what Becky did for me, which is to give me guidance and show me the way that she did. Because I knew that when coming out, I had to make a very public announcement. I had to do what Kelly had forced upon her. <laughs> because I wanted to link my historical past, everything I had done um, for 30-some years, with my future because I didn't want to have to pretend to be a new person and start over. And what I found out was that nobody cared. <laughs> it was a non-event. I was dreading, we said we refer to Shark Week. I referred to my coming out week as Shark Week because there are a few events in my past where I came out as very, I had the other thing about being um, trans or gay is that you go the exact other the way. You become, you become an attacker. And I had done that in my, in my previous career. And so I've got, I had a little crow to eat. Um, and I still do on that aspect. But my coming out was essentially a non-event. People just said basically like uh, what they told Becky, get back to work. <laughs> Thanks. Now, can you explain a little bit more about, um, I'm just going to ask a question. Yeah. <laughs> you're, okay. you're, you're allowed to ask a question. <laughs> When you say that you, you became an attacker, can you, can you give a little bit more about what that meant to you in terms of? Okay. Throughout my life, okay, I grew up um, essentially conservative Christian. 
uh, Christian college, um, in the church. I was even actually a church deacon. Um, so those were, you know, being trans in a conservative Midwestern church community is not something you were. And I still yet had, I considered myself a cross-dresser at the time, which was still something that I had in the closet. Um, but I'm bum. Yeah. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> yeah. Closets are a wonderful thing there. to not be in. Um, so one of the things I did in the mid-90s, I published a book series um, called uh, The Central Casting. They're for creating backgrounds for characters uh, in role-playing games. Um, they are out of print. Maybe uh, Hopefully that won't be the case for too long. Um, but they, I went and I assigned negative characteristic values to being gay, trans, alternate sexuality of any kind. And at the time, I did get blasted by the gaming community, which for the most part was liberal. Um, I was still very conservative. Actually, I still am. Um, it, it, is, it is a bit of an oxymoron, um, but it still works. Sorry, this is a negative value in the sense of Ability to interact socially in the game environment? Uh, no, it would create a character basically assigned what I call dark side traits. <laughs> so if you were trans, transsexual, which I also misdefined, um, you might also be mean and evil and acrimonious, uh, you know, kick puppies, <laughs> things like that. You mean we're not supposed to do that? Wait a minute, time out. Like that's not part of our. We'll talk. But can it kick? kick? Uh, I'm trying to get a sit on for years. No! Uh, but in, on I Sundays. published that, and I said one of my Three goals Sundays. in the next year is to is to republish and rewrite. So, um, and in Sunday's panel, uh, we're doing another panel on Sunday. We're going to talk about uh, some of the negative stereotypes of transgender characters that recur frequently along those lines. And it's Janelle's fault. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> try to undo your work, Janelle. Aww. I love you, Janelle. So, hey, when I made Bart's Tale 3, I introduced <laughs> female characters, okay? <laughs> so, uh, anyone else want to uh, discuss the point that they were in their career when they came out? Well, I mean, I started openly everything. Like, I mean, at the Border House, we have this strange tradition, I guess, that our profile just has, like, all of our adjectives, you know? And for me, I have a lot of non-normative adjectives. It's, like, a really long box. And so, like, <laughs> um, and so, right. I, I, yeah. And so I never had to deal with that. Though there are some people, for some I guess people don't read who writes their stuff. So some, there's some people who had no idea. You know, they just assume, like, a dude writes everything, even if it's on, like, like a feminist website, I don't know. Um, and I've had to have that conversation every once in a while, but it's, um, I didn't have to deal with that, so, yeah. That's awesome. I'm, I that's I'm that's, that's, that's always good. a good thing, I mean, right? Like, so so some of us do experience a lot of, of blowback at work, and some industries, like I said, because I feel like there's more of a concentration of us, there are better apps now to, to dealing with, with transition and transgender people as far as, especially with transgenderism as a whole becoming more and more public within the public eye and the public spectrum and our media and our entertainment, right? So I feel like those companies are, are better able to, uh, to deal with that, and that, that's a good thing. That's what we've been working toward, you know, so. That's awesome, I feel. Now, I had an interesting experience earlier today uh, on the expo floor where I met with the PR representative of a certain game company who I'd been emailing uh, under my boy name. And uh, when he met me today, he said, oh, hello, uh, sir or madam. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm and, slash or. <laughs> and, you know, he, he's, a, he's a nice guy. Uh, he, he was just very flustered in meeting me and didn't know what the polite thing to say was. Uh, does anybody have experience with people trying to be polite <laughs> but not knowing what to say? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. yes, yeah. <laughs> Oh, my favorite yeah. one. My favorite one recently. All right, so I'm I'm on a dating website, and you know I've been on MTV. I'm in the public spectrum. I'm I'm a publicly known trans woman, and so um, this person sent me this message. It's like, hey, for someone who used to be a guy, you're kind of hot. I'm like, <laughs> kind of hot. Like his back hand had the word compliment on it, and it's just like, what? <laughs> first off, I'm not kind of anything. Number one. <laughs> Number two, it's just like that, yeah, the, 
It's like, I guess that was polite, I think. Now let me set you on, I'll cover you in petrol and set you on fire. Um, <laughs> what, so. what I love is um, a lot of people will start it out with, um, they'll try to couch their, uh, their sort of displeasure with your existence as a disagreement. <laughs> Yeah. Like, I, you know, I, I respect you and who you are and what you stand for, but I, I, just, I just disagree with you. Yeah. And, I, and, it's, and I'm trying to, and I've been trying to figure out for all this time, what is it that we disagree on? Yeah. Like, do, we, do we disagree that I am a woman? Do we disagree that I should be allowed to live as a woman? Do we disagree that living as a woman, I should be allowed into female spaces, public spaces? Uh, safe spaces, any place, because uh, there, and I, I think that might be what we actually disagree on is whether or not I can effectively exist in society. Um, the good news, as it turns out, is that it's not really a debate. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm here, and that's their problem. So they can have an internal discussion with themselves over whether or not um, they agree with themselves. And I don't really care. One of the things that I find very humorous, I've got, there's a Chinese delivery guy that has a huge crush on me. <laughs> so I get a lot of Chinese, just because I like the, I like the smiles and the, oh, it's so good to see you, uh, and everything. But he's afraid to look at me. He stares at the ceiling the entire time that he's giving me food. Aww. So he, he's, oh, enjoy, no, we're so happy to have you as a customer, and he's, and he's looking up this way. And then, um, no matter how hard he tries to, to, to sort of, show that he's on my side and affectionate and, 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 and nice, calls me sir every time. Just doesn't know. There's a huge portion of the population that they're, they're trying to do the right thing by calling me sir. Um, and there's a huge portion of the trans population that gets very upset by that. Um, you know, it's like I'm pretty clearly trying to not be a sir in this world, right? There is not a big question about that. Um, I'm not, I didn't transition at 17. I'm never going to, um, I'm never gonna fool people into thinking that I was born a cisgendered woman. It's no longer a goal of mine. Um, and I, frankly, I don't feel like I should have to, who, you know, who's, who says that I need to look like anybody. Um, but, uh, but I do find it humorous that people sort of fall all over themselves trying to be like an ally or trying to be on the right side of things and just get it all wrong because they just they have no idea and I frankly I don't know how to tell them because the truth is you need to ask people right you need to be able to say what pronouns do you prefer it's not a hard question to ask but it's a very uncomfortable and a little bit frightening question because you'll ask somebody what pronouns do you prefer and turns out they're not queer in the least right? yeah. <laughs> uh, and they get very offended by that what pronouns do you prefer what do you mean by that uh, what do you mean by that I, I mean that I I think I'm supposed to be somewhere else right now <laughs> uh, that's what I mean look look at the time I get gotta go oh and that's speaking right, got a meeting uh, yeah, and a speaking meeting. of questions, uh, if anyone has questions, please start lining up right now, and oh. we'll we'll start answering in a few minutes. Who's brave? Actually, uh, I always like to, and in, in other panels that I've spoken on, I like to preface it where you're you're not going to offend me at all. I've heard <laughs> everything. We're we're in we're in the public spectrum for the most part as either creators or, or writers or activists, and so you're not going to offend us. We would much rather you ask a stupid question and get educated <laughs> than go on thinking stupid things. You'll no, probably get so. a stupid answer from us, but it's still... It might be a snarky answer It's still worth us. asking a stupid if question. If you're sensitive to snark, I, I recommend against... But one of the things we may share with you is that if you just go... if We'll evaluate that question and tell you, if you go up and just ask a trans person that, you may be offensive. Um, I also wanted to... Um, talk a little bit about how, um, as a person at least in the media, I'm not sure about like dev stuff, but um, in the media, we have a hard time trying to incorporate um, trans identities into journalism and media and how to hire people. Like where, like right now we have very monochromatic mastheads at journalism, at journalism, at journalism, at uh, publications. And um, it's really interesting because we don't have a lot of let's say, culture criticism going on at a lot of places. We don't have a lot of minority writers. And minority writers and fans don't know that there's a lot of accepting, wonderful people at all of these places. Even 
unfortunately do some sexist and stuff, but like they top fifty they hottest often, cosplay girls. Yeah, yeah. Um, that there are people who want to have this conversation, um, and one way to really do that is to start having um, these conversations so people can, like I say, start as a commenter or start as a guest writer or start as something. And unfortunately, uh, it takes a lot of initiative from the minority. You know, that just seems to be our time slot here. Maybe like in 10 years, it will be different. But like right now, it's kind of like, there are people who want to have that conversation and want to learn. So hopefully there are people who want to figure out how to better get more diverse but that's, assets. that's always the problem, right? Whenever you whenever you have a majority and you have a fringe minority group, it's always the onus of the minority to um, to sort of advocate to to get those conversations right. started, right? And I'm not saying I'm not assigning a evaluation to that. I don't think that that's right, but it's not a question of right, right or wrong. It's about you have to be pragmatic about this, right? Yeah. So if you're you know you're going to be the one who's going to know the information best, so you need to be take it upon yourself. And a lot of trans women don't want to do that, and that's fine. That's their that's their right. Well, for them, I'm here. You know, like I've clearly got no qualms. <laughs> Give me the limelight, bitches. I fucking love it. Um, so yeah, um, but I, I agree with you entirely. It is it is upon us. It's we carry that burden of starting the conversation because, like you said, people people do want to want to know. And it can be intimidating uh, writing to the editor in chief of some website oh, yeah. you read, but it's not going to hurt anything for you to just send them an email proposing an article that you think should be on their site, or write the article exactly. yourself and submit yeah. it to them. True. Right, uh, does anyone have any other comments before we jump into Q and A? Uh, I guess not. No. no. Okay. Uh, your question. I don't think that. I don't think the Q and A mic is on. The QA mic From the is diaphragm, on. project. Okay. Um, <laughs> They're not hi, this. I'm Nate. Um, <laughs> there we go. Hi, Nate. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I guess I kind of have a question about uh, legal protections. I'm, I'm from a state, Ohio, which, as far as I know, still doesn't have any protections against uh, uh, in, in employment um, for uh, uh, gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation, and I moved here to Washington five years ago. And Washington is, you know, usually considered one of the more liberal states and has uh, a fairly good law that applies to sexual orientation, uh, gender identity, and gender expression. But I found out just a few weeks ago uh, that according to the Washington Human Rights Commission, they, they put up some like posters at work, um, that the term employer uh, for the purposes of this law, this law being the, the uh, employment discrimination law, uh, includes persons or organi organizations that employ eight or more persons, which means that any company that employs less than eight people uh, can fire you for being gay or trans. Uh, and I was wondering if uh, anyone knew if this is the, the case in other states that have protections against gender uh, identity and expression discrimination uh, or other countries like Canada and if you've run into this kind of thing. It it wouldn't surprise me at all, right? Because anytime that you that you have people who are trying to give other individuals human rights, um, and you're running a, up against a conservative base, concessions are going to be made within the legislation. Um, so I I would not be shocked at all because there are very there are very anti-trans states, right? Um, and so uh, I don't think I would be surprised in the least if they had similar, even though that, that the end of technically protected trans people, if there was some caveat, right, or some sort of like malevolent or Machiavellian way that they didn't have to, to shield it uh, or, or protect these people. Um, I tend to be a little bit more pragmatic. I, um, the legal system goes both ways, right? So discrimination is discrimination, and if you can prove it, even if it doesn't fall underneath that end of protection, guess what? You now have punitive measures that you can take against the company. And that's the way that within our society, unfortunately, that fit, that the culture gets changed, right? It's either you, you have to advocate for the legislation, but when that fails, it's up to you as the citizen to, to exercise your powers that you have. And that's really the direction that I tend to lean towards because if I have an outlet, I'm gonna use it. And if it's a band stick, I will use it excessively. Um, so, and hit them where it hurts, in the wallet, so. Uh, any other thoughts on the legal uh, matters from state to state? 
Well, the issue is, is that each state has completely different laws, and some have caveats, some have exemptions for, let's say, religious organizations, et cetera. The main thing is that whatever state you're living in, you need to be aware of and familiarize yourself with the laws. Now that said, even if a state has very strong laws, they could still discriminate you against you. Because the problem is that there are people out there who will just simply ignore those laws. It then becomes now upon you to actually get those laws enforced by going to your local law centers, et cetera, and file suits against them. Because it's the only way to really get you know people who are prejudiced to actually get the message this is wrong. Um, now, if in the state that you're living in doesn't have full protections, then you should uh, work with others to get those laws changed. Because really is that if you just stand by and not do anything, the laws will never change and they'll never get better. Oh, uh, and, and add to that, you can contact the Chamber of Commerce and the Labor Board for the state that you work in because they can pull the, the company's right to do business in the state if they disagree with it. They don't need to have any legal finding. They're the ones say, I license you to do business in the state of blank, right? So if you contact them and you get a very empathic person and you make your case and they agree with you, they can threaten to, you rehire that person and you reinstate them or we will pull your business license. That's another little dirty underhanded trick that I learned. <laughs> um, so <laughs> they don't fight gonna... fair, why the fuck should I? Exactly. So. <laughs> Um, yeah. All right, uh, next question. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi. Uh, it, it's kind of an observation I was hoping to get your feedback on. I'm a middle school, or I was a middle school teacher for 14 years in oh, California. Oh, man. Yeah. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> How? Uh, I'm now teaching high school, but I've been surprised in the last two years, there is a huge, well, I, it seems huge to me, a large number of kids identifying as trans in middle school, mm -hmm. yeah. as 11, 12, 13 right. year olds, their classmates are doing great with it, by the way. Their teachers yes. are yes. not yeah. as um, ridiculous. I, I think that video games might have something to do with it, in that you, know, you get to play as someone else. Uh, I, I don't know what, what, if you have any thoughts. Or I think probably all of us up here um, spent time playing, um, doing some gender bending during, uh, <laughs> during uh, whether you're you know, online or offline. Uh, playing as different things. I think that that, um, that the, the role of gender in video games is probably a part of that. Um, but I also believe, and we can probably, we'll talk about more about that on Sunday for sure at the, at the Press XY to, uh, to continue. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. To continue. Um, so come to that and we'll, we'll definitely get to more on that. But I, I think that there's a lot of the problems that we're facing right now I view as long-term temporary problems because we, we do have such an accepting and, and loving and diverse and wonderful group of kids that are coming up in the next generation. Um, it, it's, uh, it's hard for some of us that are, that are a little bit on the older side to look and see you know these kids growing up and they can express however they feel like it it seems and and they're and they're loved by their peers and they're and they're supported by their parents and their schools there's still plenty of room to improve um but it but the world is a world it's very different than the world that we grew up in um so what i wouldn't attribute that to video games per se probably drugs <laughs> um, it's not um, <laughs> Well, actually, uh, well, just to also add on to that, uh, there's also a really large and growing like conversation about this. Like uh, right now, you can go online, you can go to, on Twitter, and hear like just constantly all day about issues about sexism, about um, you know transitioning, about racism, and like this year, if anybody was like aware of any like E3 news and all the journalists like kind of losing. Uh, a lot of, or gaining perspective on sexism with like booth babes, et cetera. Um, yeah. Exactly. Uh, it, this is like, th there was a really big increase in conversation and no one was having this conversation, you know, 10 years ago, or maybe they were just not in public. Well, right. you know, and That's so the whole, the whole thing, like w as more people start talking about it and talking to each other, like it doesn't have to be like someone at the border house needs to talk about it. Like everyone can intermingle and talk about these issues. And now when you're in high school and middle school and you hear people on your favorite w video game website talking about it, 
Like that's something you can talk with your friends. I mean, so I didn't have and, something and like it's, that. And it's common within every civil rights movement, right? Is that that like when you came from like the extremely repressive fifties and sixties that was extremely racist and extremely segregated, then you had the later generations of, mm -hmm. of younger kids growing up and racism. Not that racism isn't an issue. No one is stupid enough to make that claim. But um, <laughs> but but no. But but I mean, well, no Democrat stupid enough to make that claim. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, but but then you see other other people who were originally on the fringe start to, to gain more acceptance and more visibility, and that's what it's about. The more visibility we have, the more you're going to see people who aren't afraid to really be themselves because they feel like they have a community or a presence in video games, mm -hmm. in media, on television, on radio, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not, I, I think it makes sense, and if you look historically, it follows that trend. All right, um, let's uh, move on and try to get through a few more questions. We're a little low on time. Oh. Um, okay, really quick one. Sort of trans related specifically. Um, yeah, closer. Sorry, hi. Um, sort of a trans specific kind of question. Um, I work as a contractor, so I'm going from job to job to job a lot of the time. And I'm finding that I never really know if people are, you know, can tell if I'm a trans woman or not. <laughs> and I don't know how to broach that conversation. No, they can't. Yeah. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> that said, you know, like I don't want to necessarily be stealth. That's not actively what right. I want. I want to have these conversations. I don't know if there's a right time and a right place and how to broach that, especially in this kind of rapidly changing contract model. Well, as, as someone who was formerly a contractor who did like a lot of contract IT gigs, I, I know that feel. Right. So um, how I always approached it was that, look, you know, when, when I go to the hiring manager or the temp agency or whatever it was, I'd be like, like look, here's a situation. You're going to see um, sometimes mixed names on my on my CV or on my resume or if you check out my re or, or my references, this is why. And then leave it up to them to say that, well, I have an issue with that, because if they don't say otherwise, then, you know, then that's fine. But and now that I have enough history as as Caitlin, um, I don't really bring it up. Um, so, because I see it as kind of like a, a non-issue in a lot of uh, a lot of jobs. So, I mean, but yeah, I would I would put it out there, say, look, you may see this because of reason, and take it from there, see where that kind of goes. Um, I'm actually also I just moved to like the Bay Area, and so I'm meeting a lot of like developers for the first time as media, and I just kind of, you know talk to people and try not to bring it up even if they could and it's not like not bringing it up because it, the onus is not on you to be like hi trans badge you know yeah. like you don't need to <laughs> that is right. not what is is to be human so like I think that eventually someone will be like will say something that will initiate that conversation I tend to find that I don't have to be like, okay, it's time for our conversation. You know, like no one likes the word conversation. So yeah, that's how it happened for me. But it is your right whether or not you want to out yourself or right. not. Nobody nobody can force you to. Um, and it's it's totally your choice. When you're putting down a CV, you certainly don't have to put your name next to every job or what right. it was with time or anything like that. So yeah, do what you feel comfortable with. I look at it from this way. I don't go around to an employer saying, hi, I'm Becky, I'm a brunette. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you should. <laughs> yeah, I mean, after all, I'm also Mexican, too. Does that count? There you go. <laughs> Spill it all. All right, well, we have five minutes left, so we'll take one more question and then go on to our final thoughts. Um, I'm, I'm Richard. Um, I'm 28. Um, Hi, Richard. Over 10 years ago, my dad actually transgendered. Um, for me personally, it was a difficult process. I've always loved him very much. Um, but one of the ways we stayed connected actually was through playing MMOs. Because I was playing EverQuest 2 at the time, and he started playing it with me. And that was a fantastic uh, experience for both of us. So I guess my question for you is, have you had any experiences with your own children or oh chi other children or guardians of children, whether pre-op pre or post-op or when you're cross-dressing and what has it been like? I'd really like to take that. Um, so when I came out a year ago, um, my wife at the time took my children to Singapore to go visit her family and then informed me that she wasn't coming back, um, which was gut-wrenching to the, I mean, catastrophic in terms of my ability to function in day-to-day -day life and value myself as a person. Um, I see my kids on Skype now on Fridays. So Friday night, 9 o'clock. Um, is Skype time, and I spend time with my boys. They're nine, six, and five. Um, the middle one turns seven on the 14th, and I'm actually gonna go to Singapore and, and see them for the first time this September to be there. Thank you. I'm fucking terrified of that visit. It's very frightening. Um, 
but we spend time, we play Minecraft together, right? So I'll run a <laughs> server off my Mac, right? <laughs> And there's something like very tangible about building a house with your children. You know, yeah. it's, it's like, all right, this is our home. We have a home. Um, we'll play. We started That's playing awesome. Portal 2. Um, I had to stop my son, uh, Clayton, the nine-year-old. He, he's, uh, he's very active in the Minecraft community. He builds skins and he writes stories. And, and, uh, and at some point, he brought me to a server and he's like an op, right? So he's flying around and he's giving me diamond stuff all <laughs> left and right. And, and I'm like, you know... I said, Clayton, do they know that you're nine? He said, no, Daddy, you told me that I can't tell anybody my age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was, so I guess that's true. So if you have a, a you know, when, you're, when, you're, um, when your people can't spell very well in the game, they could be nine. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, but I had to get him to rename his Steam account because uh, he created his first Steam account so that we could play Portal 2 together. Um, and he named his his uh, his account name was Watch Me Be Annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. I said, sweetheart, you, you're not you're not you're not going to be that. You're my kid. You you're not you're not going to like. I'm not going to raise a griefer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to do a little better than that. But so online um, online gaming. Uh, MMOs. We used to play Toontown, the Disney MMO, together. We oh played Wizard 101 together. We played um, a number of games together, and it's uh, it's the only connection that I have with my children on a regular basis. So I'm I'm very very happy for for child safe spaces online. They're really important. And I'll just share that I do have experiences, um, and if someone would like to talk with me afterwards about it, I transitioned with adult children, and they both ended up being very accepting. Oh, yay. Oh, and, and on that, um, if you didn't get to ask any question, uh, most of the panels will be waiting out in the hallway afterwards for a while, so uh, if you want to know something or just want to say hi, uh, please come up and say hi to if us. If you want to buy us food, if you want to hang out, if you want to get us drunk, you know, things like that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. And also, if you liked uh, what we did here today, on Sunday at noon in this very room, we're doing another panel, uh, which will also feature panelists uh, Eric uh, Patterson here. Uh, and that'll be Sunday at noon right here. And we have a website called PressXY.com. So uh, anything that you didn't get to see here today will be posted there. Just use your Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. So sweet. Right. Table flip. <laughs> Are there any final comments that anyone wants to make? No. I think we ran out of time. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I think my, my comment would be nothing is more satisfying than playing Halo with my son and hearing on the loudspeakers, dude, I just got fragged by your mom. <laughs> <laughs>